Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Today we're going to be taking a look at quantum computing at the frontiers of biological sciences. It's a really interesting paper you can find linked below. Talk about just basically what quantum computing is and how it's used in sort of biological data science. So just starting off, what is quantum computing? Basically, when you think about classical computing, the difference between classical and quantum computing. So classical computing is what you kind of think about when you think about computing, right? Ones and zeros, right? It's kind of the sort of stereotypical phrase, ones and zeros. Computers are just made of one zero or whatever. And that's sort of true, right? Because these classical systems, you have either, you can either be in this one state or off state or zero state. Uh, but for this quantum system, well, we don't re represent them as discrete states. We re represent them as combinations of these one and zero. Uh, so basically we have our axis system. Uh, basically we either can have a, a zero or a one and we represent every state as a combination of those um, basis sets. And those those are all the, and you can represent really any function on the, on the point of the square, on this point of the sphere, if you do the math out um, and you're just representing uh, these these points on the sphere and so this actually has being able to represent your sort of data and represent information this way uh, has really remarkable advantages of very certain tasks uh, that can actually dramatically improve things and so just going a little bit more into these if we think about you know a classical bit or a c bit uh, we can either represent each bit as being a one again one to zero right um, so we have to represent a state uh, we have, you know, we can, we have to say, okay, one, zero, zero, one, one. So we, we take, we represent the state. Uh, we can do another state that's very similar. Overall, we have two to the n possible states. Um, so in contrast, instead of either a one or zero, uh, we represent a qubit as sort of this vector, a system of qubits as a vector uh, that, that consists of the superpositions or the additions of these components. Uh, in this case, we have a one component and a zero component, right? And so uh, and being able to actually represent them as combinations of, of the sort of axes uh, that we're using uh, has very interesting effects and so like this is from this paper um, but basically they say like if you're trying to, to decode this uh, number uh, very or this uh, this you know string or whatever um, using classical computing it with this is what we get and it's kind of more efficient at smaller scales but it exponentially scales uh, but using uh, quantum computing approaches they actually can get this to sort of polynomial or linear time they can uh, decrease the time from exponentially and so, um, and the sort of real, where this sort of comes from is this, this fact of, of this interference, right? So when we have a given task in this classical um, computing, you know, condition, we have to try you know, all the possible paths. We have to essentially try everything. Um, and every, every path can only contain, you know, the output that it does. Uh, but for the quantum machine, a single you know, computational path of actually doing computations can actually contain you know, multiple different amplitudes and multiple different uh, uh, positions, information from this, that superposition structure so that we can have more than just a zero or one. Um, and so kind of for a more discrete, you know, or I guess like a more tangible uh, example, we'll take a look at this. Uh, I thought this was a really interesting example in this paper. They talk about C bits. Um, and so if I ask you, you know, just think about classical bit of being uh, one and a zero, what is the not, what is the function not one? Okay, you, most people just say, okay, that's pretty easy. You just say not one, which would be the zero. Um, okay, so that sounds, that's pretty easy. But what if I asked you, what's the square root of not one? And that's a really interesting question, right? So you can't just, you can't just say 0.5. Um, well, I guess you could, but, but, but it'd be difficult to define this because ideally, right, um, the square root of not times the square root of not should be not. And if you do 0.5, you know, that's not gonna work out that way. Um, and so how do you actually do this? Well, in the classical condition, it's actually not really um, known. Uh, but let's talk about the quantum, if we can do that using quantum computing for a second. Uh, so this not one, we can actually represent as being um, in the same thing. We can actually, uh, in the same, well, the same thing, we can represent as just being zero. Um, or essentially the, like a vectorized form of zero. But now that we actually want to calculate the square root of naught, how would we do that? Um, well, we can actually just take this middle point. So this, this expression is essentially, if you do the math, if you look at it, it's just going to be this uh, perpendicular vector to this line, which is representing this common superposition of those two states, right? Um, and so we have this amplitude associated with each of these states as part of this input. Um, and if you do this out, and so this is actually a really interesting Right, because we couldn't represent this sort of square root of not in this in the classical uh, co uh, computing approach, but we are able to do this in this quantum computing approach. And the square root of this not actually has really interesting interpretation, uh, because if we square it, we actually do get what we want, uh, the zero vector, right? And so we can actually, you know, 
leverage this information. And this is a, um, and it seems like kind of a, a, a kind of toy example, but it, we're able to have this very powerful um, representation of our data and, and able to actually identify, you know, using this superposition principle uh, of states. And so uh, that that was all from the paper that we were looking at. This is actually going a little bit off of the paper, but I highly recommend you check out uh, Grover's algorithm. Uh, especially as like a first pass for your first kind of quantum algorithm if you're really interested in, in learning more. Um, but basically this is given this problem. If I give you this non-informative black box, basically just a box with a bunch of switches on it and I have a light bulb at the end and I ask you to figure out the combination of switches that's gonna turn on the light bulb, how would you do that? And so it, and the key here is that you're not getting any information. It's like, you can just try the combination and you're, if the light bulb's not gonna light up, you don't know if that one was right or that one was wrong, whatever, you, you just don't know. So the only real thing you can do in this sort of classical computing approach is just guess and check every single one. Um, and obviously that's not ideal. That's not really, uh, that takes a long time. Essentially, it could be the very last one of this combination that you actually check. So you have to go through every single state. That would be the two to the end. Um, and so that would take a long time. Um, but that, that's sort of the classical condition broke. But if we can actually, they actually, you know, he demonstrates that if you have this sort of quantum computing approach, you can actually identify this. And he, he sort of calls this like a database search. And so he's thinking about this in a way that basically you have your set of inputs. Instead of thinking about it, let's try every single state. Basically just thinking about, okay, well, we have every single state and we have, um, we, we want to, we, every single one of the outputs is going to be like zero except for the one that we want. And we want to find out which input, in which input is going to give us the output that we want. And so this is um, the sort of trade-off here. I think it does represent the trade-off. I think this is a good point time to like bring it up, I guess. Um, but basically, when we do the guess and check method, we identify a discrete outcome. We say, okay, we finally, we guess and check, and we finally found the one that turned on the light. Okay, that was probably, with probability one, this is the input that turns on this light, right? Um, but in contrast, all these quantum algorithms, they, they, they kind of follow this very uh, interesting probabilistic interpretation that quantum mechanics kind of brings. And so that they're not distributing these, uh, they're not outputting these, these probabilities equal to one or just these actual answers. They're, they're um, outputting probabilities that are less than one that are actually probabilistic answers. That might be you know, still very high, uh, but at the end of the day, they're probabilities, not discrete you know, final answers. And I think understanding that is really important for understanding these uh, algorithms. coffee so this is i'm not going to go too much into this but this is a depiction of uh, grover's algorithm uh basically the the kind of key point here is this unitary operator that's going to operate over both the states of the one and zero vectors and so this will actually get us in a, a way to be able to actually understand um how, how we can actually combine these superposition states and this is how uh these quantum algorithms work is they come they use the information from all of these states uh, to actually, you know, do the, do the task that they're talking about. Again, this is probabilistic. Um, and so you'll see that this should actually, I think, just be P and then square root of P. But basically, you'll be able to improve a lot of these algorithms um, from P time to square root of P time uh, using these quantum approaches. And we'll talk a little bit more about how Spurton biology problems actually do this. So then, next, this paper actually goes into uh, sort of quantum speedups. Uh, the source of these speedups and just kind of talks about how you know there's some tasks that there seems to be exponential speedups using this uh, quantum computing uh, there's some tasks that seem to have uh, polynomial speedups. so this is like we were just talking about uh well the task that we were just talking about didn't actually exponentially improve it only polynomially improved it which is still pretty good i think um you know better than nothing right um, and then we have these sort of heuristic approaches in quantum computing. So these are also pretty interesting. I highly suggest you uh, kind of go into these more if you're, if you're particularly interested, uh, especially with the kind of um, like parallels to sort of thermodynamics, although it's not entirely true. This adiabatic optimization and similar adiabatic processes in thermodynamics. Uh, but basically you, you identify this sort of ground state and you sort of push, you, you evolve this state using over time. So like an example of this sort of quantum annealing approach is basically you start out with the, like like we're talking about with the uh, the box and, and we're flipping the switches. We would basically start out with a solution space of all the possible uh, answers. And then we kind of narrow that down and evolve the state to the solution that we want over time. And so these are sort of uh, interesting approaches. Um, so this paper was, uh, I think, written by a lot of people that were interested in neuroscience, which I'm not as well versed on or as really interested in, uh, but I'm gonna talk about a couple of the, some more of the things that they, they mentioned. Uh, but basically, this this figure, you know, they just kind of are demonstrating. There's a lot of different problems in biology. 
Uh, biology kind of has this sort of hierarchical structure here where you start sort of with the behavior and the individual, then you go down to, you know, what the components of what makes the individual. And you're trying to understand uh, sort of how do you how do you actually understand to get from these different uh, ones? And, and they talk about how um, quantum computing approaches can be pretty helpful, like quantum neural networks and quantum um, uh, Markov models, quantum variational autoencoders um, and quantum weak squares. So like, I'm not going to talk... I'm going to talk about a couple of the examples that, talk, that they talk about here. Um, so, like, for example, we talk about sequence analysis or sequence alignment. So um, this was actually pretty interesting. I didn't, I didn't actually kind of really fully appreciate this before. But basically, if you're familiar with the BLAST or basic local sequence alignment tool, um, which is commonly used for identifying a, a tool if you have a DNA sequence or amino acid sequence and you're aligning that and trying to find other related ones, um, that task of, of actually identifying from a sequence and querying that against the database, um, you know, traditionally is this sort of linear time, but with this quantum computing approach, you could actually think about this sort of square root time, very similar to the sort of Grover algorithm uh, that we talked about before. Um, they talk a little bit more about, you know, other approaches. Basically, you know, they say, okay, well, you know, SNP imputation kind of commonly uses this hidden Markov model where these, uh, you know, adding this quantum sort of structure uh, to it and this architecture can actually, might be able to actually improve it. Uh, there's certain kinds of classical uh, algorithms that are kind of just difficult and kind of hard to make efficient, like identifying um, phylogeny or lineage trees. Uh, things like genome-wide association studies, GWAS, um, which uses, you know, least squares arguments might actually benefit from using sort of quantum least squares. Um, and so all of these are sort of are different approaches that utilize this sort of uh, quantum extra architecture to identify. And I think, I think um, it is kind of interesting. So they do talk about how Basically, these algorithms were kind of optimized for our algorithms are kind of optimized for um, for quanta for classical computing, uh, but we haven't really been thinking as much about the research for these quantum systems. So as they, they say, you know, in this paper that they think that more and more research is going to be done and it's going to be more and more efficient. I think it'll be, and this is kind of my opinion, is that it'll start going away from things like hitting quant quantum market models or quant quantum least squares and kind of developing their own algorithms and very um, interesting ways to think about it. Um, and, th and then finally talk about like functional analysis. Basically, they say they, that there's like certain kinds of constraints, um, basically, you know, smaller feature sizes and, and that there aren't as many large uh, quantum computers and that they're kind of still working on a lot of problems. But there are very certain kind of problems um, that might actually benefit from these quantum computing approaches. Uh, just talk a little bit about some of the problems with it. Uh, I think the first one, which is actually not up here, basically, there's a lot of kind of error in measurements. Um, basically, these sensitive, the engineering and kind of physical uh, representations of these systems are pretty uh, error prone. And so there's a lot of kind of research that's been doing on error checking. Um, and so that's kind of a big deal before they become like widely implementatable. Um, they also can't really interact with these classical algorithms. Like you can't really have a hybrid algorithm as easily because basically like it, 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 if you like what they talk about, essentially you'll, you'll essentially just kind of get to the more inefficient thing. Um, and, and basically you can't represent, you rely on certain that quantum computing approach uh, and you can't really run that, you know, using classical bits essentially. Um, and then next to say, finally, like basically large data sets are kind of a problem. Um, using superposition, I guess, just because, you know, it tends to be very large. Um, it takes a lot of space. Uh, they talk about some spaces like, you know, quantitative RAM that's actually been using, th that they're uh, doing research into actually fixing that. Uh, so this is, I pulled these uh, three quotes. I thought these were really interesting. I'll just kind of briefly go over these. Um, the first thing to say is, is that even though describing the quantum state of n qubits re requires an amount of information that scales exponentially with n, measurement can only extract n bits of information. So basically the like kind of state space of your system and the extraction space um, are different. And that is actually kind of a, a limitation. Um, so you, you have to, you know, very complex state space, but you can only pull from that from that so much information because the act of observing it kind of class, like collapses your system. Um, and so these quantum algorithms also can be built. Like they basically, they're, they're making the point, like the same thing with like classical algorithms. You can kind of run any kind of search on your classical algorithm tool because the gates themselves are just kind of functions. You can program them as how you want. They're saying similarly, you can just have these quantum gates that just, you know, run these quantum algorithms uh, that you don't need this, some kind of like specific underlying architecture or hardware other than the fact that these are just quantum gates the same way. You don't need the, the classical bits to be anything specific other than just, you know, being classical gates. Um, and then they say pretty much um, there is an open research problem to whether or not there actually is this uh, quantum speed up to actually whether it does exist or whether we're not essentially just being inefficient. Um, 
but they're you know they don't think it's actually going to be resolved or it's unlikely to be able to be fully resolved um so you know a lot of research being done on, on a lot on a lot of this uh so in order to actually you know just talk about when are we actually going to use this i think the answer is yes but i also think the answer is maybe like I, it might actually take like a while. It might take maybe 20, 30 years. Maybe you're watching this in 20, 30 years. Maybe it's out right now and you're talking about it now. Hopefully I have like million, million and a half views, but we'll see. And hopefully a lot of people like and subscribe because they really helped me out. But uh, other, like, I think it's going to take a while. Um, a lot of this sort of air prone, I think I've done a couple of just like, supplementary readings. Basically a lot of people in the field are saying this sort of air, um, the fact that these are so prone to air uh, and kind of sensitive is really kind of a big problem. It does seem like it's a very interesting uh, field to get into right now. There's a lot of research that's been going on. And it also seems like there are certain pat like tasks and projects that might actually benefit from this, um, you know, pretty soon or even now maybe. Um, that there seems like there might be certain very certain tasks uh, that might actually benefit. So thanks a lot for watching.